Welcome to Heartbreak and Hope with Pat Barbarito, the show that explores how to build up or break down any relationship with confidence, clarity, and compassion. Everybody's had their heart broken. I mean, if you've loved, chances are you've lost love. It's part of the human experience, right? None of us escape. And there's so many experiences that result in heartbreak. You know, it's always struck me as somewhat odd or ironic that the feeling of love, like the absolute best feeling in the world to be in love, the loss of it is so crushing. But if you're not in love, you can't get crushed. And if you're not crushed, you don't know what love feels like. The best description of heartbreak that I have found is it's a feeling of sadness, of grief, crushing fear, something you'll never get over. And having experienced it, the pain is so intense, it feels like a physical pain. We understand that, of course, a heart could break from loss that's so unimaginable. There's nothing to compare it with. The loss of a child or the death of a loved one. We're not talking about that today. Today, we're going to talk about love sickness, the loss of a relationship. Now, until recently, I always assumed if you were lovesick or you had heartbreak, you go to a therapist, you speak with a counselor. I mean, that's what I did when my marriage ended. And you understand the relationship and you understand why you shouldn't have married the person or dated the person. And then you start healing. So if you sort of intellectually understand it, it percolates down and you feel better. I never really thought about heartbreak as a medical condition, but apparently it is. With us today is Dr. Aaron Feingold, Chair of Cardiology for Hackensack Meridian JFK University Medical Center, a known authority on all things dealing with matters of the heart. So welcome, Dr. Feingold. Thank you very much, Pat. Thank you very much. I well, also I have a question. Is there a technical name for this thing called heartbreak? And I'm sorry I interrupted you. <laughs> I was going to tell you, I've had my heart broken too. Have you? Uh, sure. We all, it's part of our... Uh, our learning experience, you know, in life. Being of a certain age, I'm not suggesting you are, but I certainly am. I do think that you learn from that heartbreak. And I know I love very differently now than I did years ago. And I think there's a different resilience you have. So it's good to hear that you're one of us and you've had your heart broken and you know what it feels like. It's part of human nature and part of the whole existential dilemma in life to be able to know that. And it's, uh, you know, love, love is a, I'm not a psychiatrist, I'm a cardiologist, but love is an integral emotion that we use that wouldn't, wouldn't be there. You know, after all, our, the first proclamation is be fruitful and multiply. How does that happen? Through love. That's the human animal's way of, of getting to that point, to reproduction. And if you haven't had your heart broken, I suppose you haven't loved. I mean, I, I think it's worth the risk. Some people don't, and I feel sorry for them because they never have had the highs. For me, uh, I've had the fortune, good fortune of loving several times in my life. Some heartbreaking, some not, but worth it every time, Doc. Worth it every time. But I, I, I what amazed me is when I realized that this was a physical and medical condition, it just was like a light bulb went off. I thought, this is great. Now all that heartache makes sense. There's a condition, it's called Takatsubu, T-A-K-O-T-S-U-B-O. You know, over the, over the, the millenniums, the, everybody talked about the heart. You know, the heart is where the, the motion was, broken heart. Some people even thought it was the seat of the soul. But the whole diagnosis of heart disease really is a, is a 20th century description where you, understood what heart failure is. So in 1990, only 30, 32 years ago in Japan, they labeled a syndrome that really could also be called broken heart syndrome, and it's called Takotsubu. It's named after a lobster trap that resembles the way the heart looks on an echocardiogram with this syndrome. So you couldn't even diagnose this before the invention of the echocardiogram, which was maybe 40 years ago. So, Doc, are so, you saying that when somebody has a broken heart from an emotional experience, you can actually see it? Yes. You can see it on an electrocardiogram and you can see it on an echocardiogram. 
An echocardiogram is a is a pretty wonderful invention. It's a sonar machine, and you bounce sound waves onto the heart, and you can see the heart contract and expand. In 1990, in Japan, they took a series of patients that had severe emotional distress, mm-hmm. you know, broken hearts from love, broken hearts from divorce, death of a child, thickness, the bankruptcy, things that really caused emotional situations. And they noticed that a small percentage of those people got very, very sick. And then within three or four weeks, they got better. And what they had were symptoms of heart failure. Heart failure meaning water build up in your lungs, your legs got full of fluid, edema it's called. And if there was a particular finding on the echocardiogram. The echocardiogram bounced off the, the left ventricle of the heart and showed a ballooning an actual ballooning of the apex that's the bottom of the of the heart there and it was a specific finding and that looked to this japanese researcher like a lobster trap so how else does that picture of a lobster trap come in other words how could you as a physician determine whether or not that's a result of a heartbreak or some physical reaction or a you know heart failure how do you know the difference So that's a very, very good question, actually, because people who have heart attacks and have viral cardiomyopathies or a cardiomyopathy from from COVID or cardiomyopathy from high blood pressure also present in the same way with shortness of breath and edema, but their echocardiogram is different. This echocardiogram is pathognomonic, meaning it's very specific for what's called broken heart syndrome. So if someone comes in to see you, and I I don't think that physicians get enough credit for having to listen to their patients because they often do, is that what gives you the information so that you could determine exactly what the issue is? Well, a lot of people see me and have emotional issues. Almost everybody has something going on. Right. There's not a there's not a patient that does that doesn't have a package that they're carrying. And probably not a doctor either. And we all come in and I like to speak to my patients and learn what's going on with them. And the diagnosis of something called the cardiomyopathy, a cardiomyopathy means that the heart is injured. You can't really make the diagnosis of broken heart syndrome or takabutsa till you see it on the echo. But it's very suggestive. And everybody that comes into my office with a new evidence of heart failure, has an echocardiogram. It's a really remarkably amazing test. But to answer your question, very often I hear people say, I have a broken heart, I'm getting divorced. I I don't feel good, doc, ever since my child OD'd, you know, something like that. And, And it's something that all physicians knew empirically that there was a physical findings on this. But but the treatment for it is very, very much similar to the treatment for regular run-of-the-mill heart failure. In fact, if you read about it, it's a diagnostic type of issue, but the treatment goes along with just conservative, regular treatment. You have to rule out a heart attack. You have to rule out other causes of viral myocarditis. And then once you do that, you have a pathway to reassure the patients usually within four to six weeks, it heals. But, you know, the interesting thing about it, some people really feel that they have a broken heart and they have a normal echocardiogram. There's a uh, doctor, his name is Zahalon, Z-A-H-L-O-N. He published in the 1600s. He was a physician in Rome and he made his practice treating bubonic plague, believe it or not. He wrote a textbook called Otsar Chaim, which is precious life. He also wrote a very famous prayer for physicians, prayer that is as pertinent today as it, as it was mm-hmm. back then, asking for the right book to come into the to your hand at the right time, mm-hmm. for the right knowledge, even if you didn't study it. He realized that so much of, of knowledge and medical practice was having the right ideas and the right information at your disposal when you needed it, and actually prayed to God to have that. He 
coined in his textbook a true disease called love sickness. Rumor has it you're a bit of a, a medical historian nerd. Fair enough. So I did a little digging and it was so curious to me that this broken heart syndrome, which was given a name in the 1990s, was really written about through this rather prolific writer, Dr. Zahalan, in the 1680s. Yeah. And, and I want to ask you some things about that. I, I want to go back to something you said earlier first, if yeah. you don't mind. When you say to a patient, this is the result of your tests, what you're having is mimicking a heart attack or is physiologically a real illness, but, you know, your spouse left you, you got divorced. That almost feels like to me, you saying to me, it's kind of in your head. And, and I'm wondering how people respond to that. Because if you said that to me, I might think, well, wait, it's a real thing, right? Or are you telling me it's in my head? Help me out with that. That's a great question. You know, all all physicians, well, especially cardiologists, are confounded all the time with a patient who has terrible chest discomfort. It's, it's, it sounds like a heart attack, but when we go for the objective evidence, such as a cardiac catheterization or an echo or an, even an EKG, it's normal. So there's no real answer for that in the annals of modern scientific objective medicine. And I, I see it every single day. You know, I have to reassure people. And it's it's not good enough nowadays to say it's all in your head. You know, it really isn't because people don't accept that. I'm seeing it now with COVID right a bit, with mm -hmm. long COVID. We don't understand what long COVID really is, but people just feel really terrible. But sometimes it's just chest pain. And the objective evidence is that their heart's okay, their, their EKG is normal, but they just feel darn lousy. So there's so much that we don't know. But emotional distress and quote unquote love sickness so much presents as pain in the chest, pain in the heart. And that's why it's been that way in poetry through the ages, in literature through the ages. This broken heart cardiomyopathy, we'll call it that, this broken heart cardiomyopathy is the first objective evidence that we've been able to put to an emotional entity that, that we've known has existed since you see it described in the Bible. Because we've always sort of separated the mind, body, and spirit from the, the mind and spirit from the body. And this is the first time I've seen the two of them crossed over. Right. This is the first time that, that you really see a, objective evidence, objective, hard, strict scientific testing that goes along with emotional distress that we talked about. I think I even read that broken heart syndrome with it, the body actually has difficulty pumping blood to the, the heart has difficulty pumping blood to the rest of the body. That's very specific. Well, that's what a cardiomyopathy is. Cardiomyopathy, the heart is nothing more than a muscle, special muscle that squeezes. Blood enters the heart and it's squeezed in the heart, first to the lungs and then to the rest of the body. When the heart muscle is deficient in its ability to squeeze, then the rest of the body is deficient in blood. And there's even a very small percentage of people that can die from this. In a different type of cardiomyopathy, a third die. But in this particular one, the number is about 4%, 3 or 4%. And it's very early on. But it's really based upon the fact that the cardiomyopathy prevents the function and the capability of the heart muscle to work. It's called cardiogenic shock. So I'm, I'm reminded as you're speaking of an incident not too long ago, one of the tragic school shootings where the teacher died and the husband went to the funeral a few days later, a young, healthy guy, and dropped dead. And you have to wonder, is that a coincidence or is that a broken heart? Right. You Absolutely. know, it really left me thinking, wow, is that possible? But you're telling me it is? It certainly is possible. And one of the factors that people feel portends to broken heart syndrome and portends to the cardiomyopathy is an excess of adrenaline. Epinephrine is another word. If the body is bathed with an excess of adre adrenaline is produced in the fight or flight response that the body gets. And you probably get a fight or flight response with a broken heart. 
And when the body gets that fight or flight epinephrine surge, you can it can produce what's called ventricular fibrillation. You can have a sudden death arrhythmia. That's how this kind of thing can be explained physiologically. It's pretty amazing. You know, it really is the way the way the mind body relationship is. There's such a relationship between the brain and the heart, the brain and the stomach and the brain and everything else is just yeah, amazing. I, I know. I mean, we always, you know, for years and years, we heard about stress and mind body. And, and I'm not so sure it got a lot of real traction until the last, I don't know how many years, you would know better than me. But I know I personally always dismissed it. The, oh, really? You know, just take care of yourself. But the truth is stress will kill you. And so will heartbreak if you don't take care of yourself. I mean, that is just the reality of life. It's just shocking to me. It's the way you perceive it. If a mosquito bit your arm and you didn't know it was a mosquito and you thought it was cancer, that mosquito bite would, would hurt so much. But as soon as you find out it was a mosquito, you'd forget about it. So the the brain does such things. You know, I, it's a funny story. I, there's a very, very prominent endocrinologist, and he's a friend of mine. I hadn't seen him in a few years. And he had emotional stuff with his children and his grandchildren. And he got very sick, very, very sick. He was hospitalized. And for a time, they were even thinking of a heart transplant. All of a sudden, he got better. And he's fine now. And he was telling me anecdotally about the story. I said, you had this broken heart cardiomyopathy. He said, what's that? I never heard of it. And this is this is a, was a, a very prominent endocrinology researcher. And, you know, he was so taken back by that. He read everything he could find. And now he's like a zealot. He walks around. He said, I had this syndrome. And, Cause well, what did he give to his patients, though, to understand it? Yeah. He now saw himself not as a crippled heart patient, but as a, a person that suffered this emotional cardiomyopathy and is on the mend. For him, it was just the knowledge that this exists was a therapeutic enhancement for him. Let me say that I speak for myself and I'm sure our audience that it is so refreshing to share with our audience that physicians are interested in the mind body. They are interested in your story. I think it gives people hope that they could be looked at as a whole entity and not as, you know, just the body and just the mind. So I'm really grateful for people like you who think like that. Faculty of a medical school and uh, the new Hackensack Medical School. And they had a had a dean, very interesting woman. The school is a new school. And she was preaching that a physician has to be out in the community for five years. And our new medical school is going to take exceptional students that have life experience. And I stood up and I said, I thought I was so cute when I made this statement. I said, doctor, what would you rather have? A cardiologist that can put a stent in the left main coronary artery, prevent the heart attack from happening, but never says a word to you? Or would you rather have somebody that cardiologist that lived in the Congo and feels your pain and has been there for 10 years? You know what she said? Both. <laughs> That's a great answer. So but you she shut me, me right down because I was proud of our, our practice being able to put stents in just like that. I want you to say that. Nope, you have to be both. But nobody used to think like this. When you went to medical school, was anybody standing up there saying yes, both? Did people even think like that? I had a course in psychiatry. That's about it. And it was basically taking care of very, very, very sick patients that had psychological psychotic episodes. But I became intrigued. When I was training, there was a cardiologist that talked about literature that Married people live longer. People with children have longer. And I said to him, what is that all about? How can that be? And he was just getting to the to this. But he spent a lot of time trying to tell us that peace of mind keeps heart disease away. I'll tell you something else interesting. And we're diverting a little bit. But there's some literature out of the Mayo Clinic that says that cardiac patients who've had heart attacks and bypass and go to rehab have a 40% less mortality rate than patients who don't. It's a known fact. Now, why is that? That's because in rehab, 
are dealing with the emotional. They see the same people all the time. They exercise with these people. They interact. They're not alone in their apartment thinking about their pain and their heart. It has to be an all-inclusive treatment plan and understanding. Yeah, well, you know, community matters. If we haven't learned that as a result of COVID, I don't know, we haven't learned anything, but community matters. And it's not surprising that that's something that came out of the Mayo Clinic. It really does matter. Well said. You're right. You know, it takes a village and all that good stuff. Let's go back to our friend, uh, Dr. Sahalan uh, from the 1680s. You know, I was reading some of his writings. I mean, it's it's extensive. And, and when you read it, he sound, sounds like a modern day, you know, psychoanalyst speaking. You would never yeah. know that it's from the 1680s. And he talks about the symptoms of broken heart syndrome, sinking of the eyes, weeping, shaking rapid pulse, a change of mental state. But what was fascinating to me is he also talks about treatment. So I want to talk to you about this because his yeah. first recommendation for, because we all want a cure, right? If my heart breaks, I want to go to you and I want you to tell me, this is how you can fix it. Pat, you'll be out of bed tomorrow. We all want a cure. Not so easy because his first cure that he recommends, and this was so amusing, is obtain the desired object. So let's talk about that. So basically, <laughs> your marriage, I would like, and I like your that. husband comes back. It was a crappy marriage. And then you're cured? Talk to me about that. What's that mean? Well, Zehalon didn't know about echocardiograms, you know? Zehalon was, was dealing with uh, with the emotional upset and the, the what he described as lovesickness was a person who took to their bed, you know, was crying, had a fast pulse. So we all know that if you have a crush on somebody and it's unremitting, it can destroy you for that moment. And then when you get it, you finally obtain the object. You may have forgotten about it. So I always liked that. Delon was very smart. Obtain the object. He was very you smart. Know? Then he says, which I thought was great, is he suggests one of the treatments to get over a broken heart is to think something faulty about your sweetheart. Yes. I'm very, I'm very impressed with your research. Wow. Again, I knew you were a medical historian nerd, so that's why I did it. I so you think something faulty? Yeah, they like what is that like? And they weren't so great. What do you do? Yeah. I mean, Delon must have had his own heart broken. You know, oh, living there. There's no way this guy didn't live life because he was brilliant. And the couple of other ones I want to ask you about. He says uh, indulge in other interests. Now, is he talking about like I'm thinking? Look, when I've had my heart broken, truth is I eat ice cream in bed. I got to be honest. If that's not really another interest, is it? I think he means like running or exercising or something else. That's what he means. Like I joined the wrestling team. <laughs> Did it work? So, yes. But it, it, it means just change your focus, actually. Change your focus. That's all I mean. That's pretty. Where did you find that? That's great. Well, because it, it this topic has been so fascinating to me because, again, we've all lived. I'm almost 66 years old. I've had my heart broken. And it's amazing to me when I think back to those times in my life where I thought, this is it. I'm not getting out of bed. I can't even connect with that pain anymore. You know, it's it's like a different person. So it's obviously fixable. I did a little bit of research on this. First of all, I have his original book. If you ever want to come down, I'll show it to you. It's in Hebrew. I actually have his original book that that was written in. And, it, you know, he was a unique thinker. But if you read medical historians throughout the entire ages, there was there was a very famous one called Avicenna. And even Hippocrates, he, they all talk about emotional love, love sickness and this. He, so he took that and, and brought it up into his era. He spent most of his career fighting the plague. So there must have been all kinds of emotional, uh, you know, trials in his thinking. But nowadays, there's no such thing as love sickness. The only thing that I've ever come across is this heartbroken cardiomyopathy. You don't read about it anywhere. You know, even in, even in Psych 101 in medical school, we didn't talk about, uh, you know, that type of thing. But it's so relevant. It's amazing how relevant it is. I also, when I was doing a little research, I came across a, um, a professor at the Department of History at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, Professor Rudnick. And she writes uh, extensively about love sickness in the 16th and 17th centuries. And uh, first of all, she introduces her work with this quote. For love is as strong as death and wrath bitter as the underworld. Its coals are coals of fire. Violent are its flames. I love that. Me too. People have 
have left this world for love. It's it's the reason for suicide. It's the reason for abandonment. Love has caused men and women to abandon their families. It It's a blindness. Some people say, you know, this whole passion of love, you know, not even for the actual sexual act. It's the emotional high that people describe when they've had that feeling in life. And they and even if it even if it ended bad, people wouldn't trade it. So I know there's songs that are written about that and poems that are written better to have lived, loved and lost than never to have loved and all that cliche. But it's but there's amazing. a reason they're, you know, I, as you know, I'm a divorce lawyer. I've been a divorce lawyer for 42 years. So I, I see people every day who are like they're 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 zombies. They're emotionally in shock. I can't imagine they're not having physical episodes. You know, they're shells of themselves. It is hard. It's heartbreaking to watch them, let alone for them to go through it. I also I had a marriage that ended. I know what it feels like. What's interesting to me is that in the 16th and 17th century when it's written about the same symptoms then are true now so when uh, professor rundick wrote about the 16th and 17th uh, century she writes about leanness losing weight sometimes i've gained a few pounds but i've lost a few too okay uh paleness sunken eyes change in pulse neglecting your body insomnia and those are the same things now that you right. get from heart sickness. So it's what was fascinating is things really haven't changed when it comes to love, has it? And probably a, a, a significant percentage of the people that that this professor and Zeklon was describing may have had or did have Takatsubo cardiomyopathy. And we don't we'll never know, but nothing's changed. And my bet is hundred years from now, it's gonna be the same craziness. Now, if you go in to see uh, many doctors, you're going to come out with a prescription for Xanax and Prozac. And nobody's going to sit there and say, uh, guys, this is your love sickness. It'll get better. So that that leads me to a question. What do you tell the heartbreaking patient who comes in? They're convinced they're having a physical episode or they, in fact, are. What do you do? What do you tell them to do? How do you handle that as a physician? Well, I'm I'm working as a physician at my old age now because I, I like this kind of stuff. I like to get to know the families. And the electronic medical record is very difficult because I all over my charts are notes. Lost a, lost a child 16 years ago to, to an overdose, was divorced twice. There's no place for that in electronic medical records. But I get into that, and I feel just talking about it with these patients is therapy in itself. We talk about it. We find out. To use one of Zehelan's postulates, they'll tell me how they, they miss their husband. And I'll say, he wasn't such a nice guy. Come on. You told me he you told me he hit you, or you told me that he, he had a girlfriend. Why are you crying like that? So that's a way to use what he said to uh, find fault. A lot of the broken heart, I find, is when a husband loses a wife or they've been married for many, many, many years, and there's a there's a death, you know, of a spouse. I attribute that to love sickness. It's very similar. So somebody loses a spouse, they are love sick. They are physically and emotionally devastated. What's interesting is most of the time, they will rise up again and find love again and take the risk all over again. So you know, I always wonder what is it about us. What is it about us? I mean, I've never given up and 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 my life figured itself out. What is it about us, no matter what depths of despair, never getting out of bed, sick, we find love again. It, it's a, it's, it's a ev- real comment on the human spirit. It's evolutionary. You know, I, I, I was just telling somebody this. I had a patient. I still have the patient. He His wife died. He was destroyed. Plus, he had a cancer that caused him to lose his bladder and he had to create another bladder. So here's a man in his in his early 70s. He couldn't even talk. I saw him a few years later. He was the happiest guy in the world. That happy. What's going on? He met a woman and it was it. He was so happy. I, I, I couldn't believe it. And it amazed me because it was the opposite pole. So why does this happen? You know, the, the chemical understanding is, is it has endorphins that came about. But uh, 
I don't have the answer, but I'm amazed every day. This podcast is all about heartbreak and hope, and I, I'm very hopeful and very optimistic. So when I hear those stories, my heart is full and warm because I do think there's hope. I mean, no matter how bad things are, and look, there are certain circumstances that are just, you know, again, unimaginable. But when I hear something like that, I think, yay, because the human spirit is is so resilient. It's a great story to hear. I tell that story to, uh, to other patients because it helps them. And I have, there's so many of those stories that I see. It really is a comment on the human spirit and our desire to never give up emotionally. I think if you asked most people of a certain age, what would you rather have once you have all your basics covered? Absolutely a full heart would be the answer because it's a miracle as to what it does to your heart and soul. There's nothing like it. But what you're telling us, doctor, is that, look, there's no magic bullet that's going to cure love sickness. But, you know, what I'm hearing from you is that the next time you have a broken heart, be kind to yourself. Nurture yourself because it's real. Yeah, it's real. And we have to and your physician has to take it seriously. And if you have a broken heart and you have real symptoms, go see your doctor. So tell me about why people get divorced so much. It's amazing, isn't it? I, I will tell you, ironically, I do not encourage divorce. Many times people will come in and I say, yeah, it's not, you're not going to get divorced. You're not so bad. Figure it out. I, I genuinely think one of the reasons people get, probably not politically correct to say this, get divorced so often is it's easy. I mean, first of all, there's nothing like new love. So let's start with that. So you're yeah. married a really long time. Somebody strikes your fancy, as they say. There's nothing like that feeling. The problem is what people don't understand is that feeling is fleeting because nothing, that high just doesn't last. I think a lot of times people get divorced because they're they're addicted to that feeling. And it's very easy to walk away. I mean, this is probably something I shouldn't say for my profession, but I believe that whole for better, for worse thing, it should mean something. Look, there are times people should get divorced. I mean, you know, there's circumstances of of abuse, of 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 infidelity, of uh, addiction. I mean, there's a lot of reasons people should get divorced. But a good part of the reasons that people get divorced is they found something better. They fell out of love. I don't know what that means, because I think if you were in love once, you could go back and find it. And they want something different. That's what I think. You know, it's a complicated thing, divorce. You know, I, I went to a, an Indian wedding a few years ago, and I actually quote this a lot to my patients who are unhappy in their marriage. And the, 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 the groom came in on a white horse, and the holy man said, look at the way that the groom is looking at the bride. You know, look at them right now. And, you know, he said in 20 years, 40 years, 10 years, when, when they hate each other, whatever they see in each other, it's there. It's there, and they have to look hard to find it. When people come in to see me, Doc, what I do a lot of times is before I talk about the legal things, I'll say, tell me about your story. Don't tell me why you're here. Tell me about how you met, your first dates. Inevitably, you could hear when there was a really strong connection in the beginning and when there wasn't. And when I hear that real connection in the beginning, I say to them, look, I'm a divorce lawyer. I'll get you divorced. I'm good at it. But just want you to think about those early years. And if you can get back there, you'll fall in love again. Because, you know, there's a famous saying that if you're going to stay married, you have to fall in love with your spouse a thousand times a year. It's true. You have to fall in love with your mate all the time. It's not a constant state. And and I encourage people to try to fall, re-fall in love with their spouse. Because there's times when you're in love with them. There's times when you like them. There's times when you don't. If you had a strong bond in the beginning, I really believe it. And I, I realize how third it is. I say this as a divorce lawyer, but I believe it. And I'm a divorced person. I say that at least once a day. I ask a, cu- a couple because very often a f- husband comes in with their wife. Where did you first meet? Yeah. And the stories are so incredible. And, and I, I think they leave, as you say, they're not here to get a divorce with me, but they leave more enthused look caring for each other medically more, less ambivalent to the spouse's medical problems. So that's why I do it. Yeah, because when you remember that feeling or why you fell in love and you reconnect with it, 
there's just a light that comes into people's eyes when they tell that story. But there are times I have to say when I ask people that and they tell me their story, there was not a strong bond in the beginning and you could hear it. You pick that up. You're right. But nostalgia is an emotion that brings you home. You know, it brings you back, it brings you safe. And I think by talk, asking families and couples about that, you bring them back in some way. I, and I, I really, think as professionals, we have an obligation to do that, quite frankly. And I think, I think part of this treatment, I'm just making this up as I go, but I think part of the treatment to cure this, this Takasubo cardiomyopathy would be to do similar things, make people comfortable, you know, you know, first love or new love, nothing like that. Nothing you know, like it, but you know, there's also nothing like history and comfort with somebody. You got to look back to go forward. That's sure do. You know, Dr. Feingold, I really so appreciate you speaking with us today, but from my heart, I'm grateful for physicians like you that think about these things, that understand the complexity of the mind and body connection. So thank you. Just thank you. Thank you, Pat. I enjoyed this very much. Thank you so much for joining us today. Don't forget to follow us on your favorite podcast platform. Please give us a five-star rating and leave a review so more people can listen in to Heartbreak and Hope with Pat Barbarito.